Okay, so we'll start. And uh, we started uh, in the last lecture about uh, just an introduction about when we perform discrete time operation. And then we focus on charge rather than current. Now what will happen? And what will happen for a resistor? Because resistor is not a, it's not an element with memory. Therefore, what will happen for resistor is to effectively not to have any role to play in discrete time. And therefore, we replace it with some equivalent circuit. That equivalent circuit is, is a combination of switches and capacitors. And that equivalent circuit will give you equivalent charge for each cycle of the clock. So that was the definition. And in fact, we briefly covered uh, this operation. Now just quickly again, I repeat it. You assumed you have a capacitor which gets connected to a voltage V1, single ended voltage. And this capacitor also is connected between node corresponding to voltage V1 and ground. And in the second phase get discharged. So now we want to see that what is the effective charge which is stored on this capacitor every cycle. That is proportional to V1 and C. So therefore effectively we have the C V1. And V1 effectively is the samples of the input voltage at every clock cycle. In discrete time domain, unit of time measurement is the clock cycle. Therefore, for simplicity, we use integer n, and n means n capital T. Capital T is the period of the clock. So we measure the time with the units of T. So now it's discrete. 1T, 2T, 3T. Sometimes also we talk about T by 2. So, but still our units are T by 2. So it's a discretized unit. So V in N means that the input voltage at the clock period of NT. So, end clock period. And then we assume V in is almost constant during this cycle. And therefore, we know that the capacitor will have the charge stored on it as CV in N because the initial charge is zero. And if this charge it wants to be equivalent with the average current, with the integration of the current drawn from a resistor during same time with the same voltage, naturally that becomes integral from zero minus to T minus of V in N upon R equivalent. And by just making these two equal with each other, considering V in N is constant, of course, it, dt is missed here, so dt will be here. So, this I will correct it. So, therefore, we will get the R equivalent is 1 upon C multiplied by T or 1 upon C divided by F. So, this is equivalent R and therefore now we can replace resistors in an equivalent continuous time analog domain, switched capacitors in discrete time and have all functions that we have already implemented or realized in continuous time domain like for example RC filters or active RC filters, we can convert them to equivalent discrete time and that has a huge advantage. One of the important advantages of this transformation is resistors will get converted to 1 upon C. Therefore, RC becomes ratio of two capacitors. And in contrast to continuous time domain that RC will experience a huge variation, process variation, and therefore design of the filters will not be so straightforward. We have to consider control of the corner frequencies. Here, the ratio is almost constant. Of course, it's not 100% constant. But considering first order effect, if you have two capacitors of the same type and they have been laid out with respect to each other in a symmetric fashion, this ratio of these two capacitors will have a change with respect to voltage, for example, of the same percentage. So therefore, that will help to keep the ratio constant. And that is one of the reasons discrete time filters are of importance. And in uh, many cases, they actually are used. 
Of course, there is a price that we pay and that price is because now we are approximating continuous time with discrete time. So we expect the frequency domain behavior or information to get distorted. First of all, we know that with non-ideal sampling, we have already learned that because of the convolution with sync or multiplication with sync, we will get some distortion. This is the first effect. Now we will have also effects because of the approximation of resistor with this equivalent element and this transformation. So, because another point is that when we talk about the discrete time processing, our frequency, Nikes rate will give us the sampling, an idea about the sampling rate. Ideally, if we are much above sampling uh, Nikes rate, we will have much less distortion. And that is coming because of that sync behavior. So, similarly, we will see the same notion over here in discrete time domain when we want to have this conversion from continuous time to discrete time for realization of the circuits. See, one more thing also you notice is we, we don't need really always have a capacitor switch to input voltage and ground. We may switch the capacitor between some input voltage and another voltage. So, therefore, both are possible and in both cases, scenario is same. Nothing will change. The only difference is that the initial charge on the capacitor, instead of to be zero, will be the, for example, V2 in the previous cycle. Therefore, the initial charge is V2 n minus 1. And the new voltage at phase 5 1 will be V1. Therefore, the capacitor charge will change by V1 n minus V2 n minus 1 into C. Similarly, in phase phi 2, when we connect it to the output, we will have V2n minus C into V1n as the new charge is stored on the capacitor. Uh, as the uh, change on the charge in the capacitor and the new voltage becomes V2n. So, therefore, the both cases are possible and that doesn't have any uh, conflict with our definition that we are looking at the average charge which is taken or given to a particular node. So, here we take charge from particular node V1. So, accumulated charge or equivalent charge over one cycle and then we give some charge to node V2 at again given time or accumulated charge for a given cycle. So, now here we want to move from this discrete time. So, this is discrete time operation in time domain. Now, we have understood it. So, we know that what is happening. But we want to see that now what will happen for the frequency domain behavior because now we want to talk about filters. So, if I have a continuous time filter and I want to convert it to a discrete time filter, what will happen for the transfer function of the filter? And to understand it, the best, simplest transfer function I can think of is integrator because the transfer function is simply 1 upon s. So, in omega domain, it is 1 upon j omega in continuous time domain. So, I will look like now what will happen for that in discrete time. First of all, when we integrate, in fact, here when I was talking about integration, I implicitly considered integration. But you know that when we want to integrate a function, the function after all practically is not a constant function necessarily. So, the question is that when I integrate this input voltage for example or output voltage over one cycle, what is effectively the value of V I consider during integration? And you know that when you want to define an integration, from continuous time converted to discrete time, you have different approximations and you have different ways to derive the area under a curve. Integration after all is deriving area under a curve. Let's look at it in an abstract manner. I have a function of x of t as a function of time and then I look at the discrete time samples over time axis and then I look at the value of input voltage. 
So this is actually what we are doing when we are doing sample this track the signal, hold it on a storage capacitor. But the question is that suppose if I want to take integral of this x of t from n minus 1 into t to n t, means 1 clock cycle. So what value of x of t I should consider here? Should I consider x of n minus 1? The way it is shown here. And I consider, okay, so the value of x of t is approximated by value of n minus x at n minus 1. Should I consider x at n t, which is not shown over here, but I can consider x at n t and then consider it over the entire period. I may even consider the average of x of n minus 1 t and n t and other approximations. And this is what actually is used for even definition of integration. In fact, the equations which are solved by simulators in time domain, they are not actually continuous time. We cannot have continuous time simulation by simulators. Simulators actually convert the time into discrete time. And the time step that you see as a setup in simulator is exactly for that purpose. Consider time step is something like a crack period here. And what we do in the time, with time step is that we approximate integration with Exactly the same phenomena or the approximation we write over here. In the continuous time uh, domain, which is integral, we need to have dt close to zero. And then dt infinitely close to zero is not possible using the computational platform. So therefore, dt becomes small but not zero. And therefore, there also we deal with discrete time and there also we deal with the definition of integration. So definition of integration matters a lot in these systems. So similarly, for our approximation, where, where we want to actually make discrete time circuits, we need to know what is this approximation. Now here, first approximation we are looking and then we focus on it and the other approximations will follow similar discussion is forward Euler approximation. So Fe here means forward Euler approximation. So when we say forward Euler approximation, that means that you take the input at n minus 1 and look forward. In the sense that for one cycle from n minus 1 to n, if I want to integrate, I will consider the sample at n minus 1 at the value of x. So therefore, if I want to define this integration, it becomes t into x n minus 1. So this is the first approximation. Now, if you look at this integrator as a system, and therefore, now I'm writing the integrator in discrete time. In discrete time, I replace this integration by t into x into minus 1. Fine? Considering x now is constant and equal to x at n minus 1t. So the output of integrator, say, called y of t. Now I'm looking at the output of integrator at two discrete times. One is nt, one is n minus 1t. So therefore, the output becomes y n t minus y n minus 1. And that is equal to t x n minus 1, right? So just simply take z transform from both sides. Therefore, the transfer function of this integrator with forward Euler approximation in z domain will be t upon z minus 1. This is just a simple taking a z transform from left side which is y and right side which is x in this simple equation. It's a difference equation in time domain. Now we are converting integral into simple time difference equations. And then if you take z inverse, z transform from both sides, the transfer function becomes t upon z minus 1. And this transfer function is equivalent with the transfer function in s domain which is 1 upon s. Therefore, now we understand how Z and S are related. So effectively, S, now if I use this relation, S becomes Z minus 1 upon T, or Z becomes 1 plus ST. So now this is first approximation. Actually, this is the approximation that you are familiar with it. In fact, directly also you can write. You know that Z is E to the power, E to the power ST, right? 
So therefore, you just write a expansion of function uh, e to the power x right here. So e to to the power s t. If you write the expansion and then you consider only the first two terms, that you will get one plus s t. So therefore, this is effectively same thing. And then the approximation we are making here is that we assume that the signal is almost constant. Therefore, the component of the signal, which make those, you know, s squared t squared terms are negligible. That means that st is small enough. And actually, when we say st is small enough, t is 1 upon fs. That means that magnitude of s with respect to fs is small. So if I go to Fourier domain, it becomes eventually magnitude of f with respect to fs. And that itself means that the Nyquist rate is quite high. That is same thing. Therefore, this approximation is coming from there. Okay, so now we have a way to see the relation between z and s. And as you can see that, that we expect to create a distortion. And that it will do because z is e in omega domain is e to the power j omega t. But we have approximated it with 1 plus j omega. And therefore, we will have distortion. But before looking at the distortion, now how we can implement this integrator in discrete time domain? And this is one way. So eventually, this is an integrator. In fact, if you look at integrator in continuous time, you can simply put a resistor over here between V in and negative terminal of open. The simple resistor R. And you have capacitor C. So this will give you an integrator with a gain of minus 1 upon RC in continuous time domain. So now simply what we do is that we replace that resistor with a switched capacitor circuit. So this switched capacitor circuit actually is very similar to the switched capacitor example that I showed you at the beginning for implementation of a discrete equivalent discrete time for a resistor. So in phase phi 1, we sample input. And in phase phi 2, we transfer the sample to C2. And C2 has initial charge on it. So therefore, it gets accumulated. So this is integrator. It just gets accumulated. It's like an accumulator. It accumulates charge over time. So this is an integrator. So interesting point over here is that you may ask, okay, so what about this forward Euler approximation? How this can become a forward Euler approximation? Any thought? Why this is a forward Euler approximation? We can understand this is a discrete time approximation of integrator because I just replaced it with a switched cap and therefore I'm looking at a equivalent charge transfer to the capacitor and discharge from capacitor in one cycle of the clock. That is fine. So I can understand. But why it is forward delay? One cycle delay. So how do you see that one cycle delay? Let's assume phi 1, phi 2, half cycle delay. Okay, so let's put it in that way. If you actually assume switches are not ideal in practical scenario, it will take some time to charge capacitor C2. Practically, if you want to be uh, precise, the value of V out will settle at the end of phi 2. Right? Right before falling edge of phi 2, it will settle. If I consider phi 1 and phi 2, 1 phi 1, 1 phi 2 phases as the clock cycle, so therefore, practically, at the end of first clock cycle, which is the beginning of next clock cycle, I have the out ready. So that means that the input that I sampled will be given at the output in the next cycle, or will be ready for the in the next cycle for the next cycle. So I have one cycle delay. So therefore, that is exactly the notion of this v in n minus one. If I'm looking at v out at n and I'm sampling at n, the v out n will have settled value of V in N minus 1 on the capacitor. Right? Is that clear? So this is very interesting circuit. First of all, it's relatively simple. You need only two capacitors and two switches. Of course, because of the charge injection issues, we have to uh, 
uh, also see that if it has problem, convert it to bottom plate switch inside. But in general, we take advantage of constant ratio of the gain of the integrator. And that's a huge advantage which has made these circuits, though they are invented, invented long time ago, but still they are being used. So now when you have this circuit, you can actually analyze it in time domain and derive the transfer function. So when you want to analyze these circuits, always analyze them in two different phases. See, almost all switch capacitor circuits work in two phases because we need to track and we need to hold. So therefore, we need to take the charge, we need to transfer it and hold it somewhere else. So that's why always at least there are two phases, sometimes more than two. Specifically, when we want to take care of charge injection, we have also phases which have a little delay with respect to each other, which switch will turn off first. We have discussed before. So in phase 5, 1, we sample. Therefore, the charge which is stored on the capacitor C1 will be eventually C1, the in N minus 1. Because I'm looking at N, therefore I call it N minus 1. You can call it N, V in N, then your V out becomes N plus 1. Doesn't matter. So therefore, this phi 1 is the phase you store the charge on the capacitor proportional to V in. Therefore, now you have the sample of in on the capacitor. In phase phi 2, you transfer it. So the initial charge on the capacitor C2 is C2 V out N minus 1. And then you are transferring another charge, which is C1 V in N minus 1. And because the direction of charge, which is transferred, is opposite to the stored charge, that's why here we have minus C1 V in N minus 1 with respect to output. And that is, now I can say that, this QC2N, the new value is C2 without N because I wait enough so that the voltage across C2 will settle by end of I2. Therefore, it's ready for phase of N, uh, clock cycle N. That's why I write without N. End of I2 is the beginning of I1 in the next cycle. So, I can write it without N. So, therefore, now I can take Z transfer from both sides. And here you see that uh, simple relation. And in fact, this relation is easily also directly by looking at this circuit, you can derive it. Because this is minus 1 upon RC, right? Into 1 upon S. You know the value of R or expression of R as a function of C1, which is eventually minus 1 upon C1F, right? 1 upon C1F. Now you have the value of C2 as well. So therefore C2 multiplied by this will give you minus C1 by C2. You have 1F, but you have also 1T because of the conversion of forward Euler approximation, which was given here, this one. So therefore this T will, get, will cancel the F, and therefore you will get 1 upon Z minus 1, and if you multiply numerator denominator by z inverse, you will get z inverse upon 1 minus. This is actually 1 upon z minus 1 that we derived it before. In z domain, it is preferred to use z inverse just because we have e to the power minus sts. That's why e to the power minus sts. So, and because z is defined e to the power sts, that's why z inverse is more common. Otherwise, this is actually 1 upon z minus 1. Okay, so this is quite clear. So, in fact, I go back to this relation. See, this is our equivalent, which is T by C, or 1 upon C F S. And C, in the example, we have is C1. So, therefore, you just replace 1 upon R C by R equal to 1 upon C1 F into F. And that will get multiplied by 1 upon S. 1 upon S is given from here, which is T upon Z minus 1. And that's why that you will get this minus C1 by Z. So now look at the, the comparison between the two cases. In continuous time, we have minus 1 upon RCS. In discrete time, we have minus C1 by C2 into Z inverse upon min 1 minus Z inverse. And that means that here 
the gain of the integrator, if you call one upon RC as gain of integrator, doesn't change with the process corners. In real applications in continuous time, R and C or even don't follow each other. For example, you may have corners when R and C both have their maximum value or both have their minimum value and therefore you will get huge variations. Variations of R and C can become something around 20 percent which is significant and in fact in the best technologies. So, that is why uh, making a continuous time RC implementation on the chip is not a straightforward and more often it is avoided. Any question? So, a little about omega domain because see we talked about S domain. Let us see what happens in omega domain with this uh, forward dealer approximation. See, this is the same transfer function I am writing. See, this minus C1 by C2 is the gain. So, just it is written on the numerator and this is actually 1 upon z minus 1. So, therefore, look at it as 1 upon z minus 1. And z is e to the power st, s is j omega t. Capital omega is the omega in analog domain, analog continuous time domain. And capital omega multiplied by t is the small omega which is used in discrete time, it changes from 0 to 2 pi or minus pi to plus pi. So, if I uh, use the extension, so I will get this relation. So, this is showing the distortion I am getting in omega domain. If you notice, if omega t is extremely small, that means that the we are well above Nyquist rate, much above Nyquist rate, I can approximate the denominator with j omega, which will give you the same ideal integrator function. But practically, these terms create error and distortion. So, therefore, if I go with ideal case means when omega t capital omega t is much less than 1, so that I can ignore second and third and further terms, then I will get the ideal transfer function of the integrator with equivalent resistance of t by c1. Sorry, this t should be in denominator, I correct it. This t is in denominator, not in numerator. Okay. And minus C1 by T is the equivalent minus 1 upon R. So, I will correct this, but so we will get the J omega, 1 upon J omega. So, we understand the conversion and the error that we get. So, here I show other conversions also which are similarly derived. One is backward dealer approximation means that you take if you are talking about n minus 1 to n, you use x of n as the value of x for the cycle from n minus 1 to n. And therefore, you will get backward dealer approximation. In that case, relation between s and z will change in this way. Like for example, 1 upon s plus st becomes 1 upon 1 minus st, which are equivalent of each other when st is very small. So, this is another way of approximation. And there is a third way of approximation which is very common, which is called bilinear approximation. It needs more number of switches and capacitors, but it will give you, it uses this concept. We do not use x of nt, we do not use x of n minus t, we will use average of them. And therefore, we expect to get better approximation, which is true we will get better approximation. And here the relation between s and z becomes a function of like z minus 1 and z plus 1 both, which was for the case forward and backward dealer approximations. Or similarly for z if, uh, as a function of s is a combination of 1 plus st and 1 minus st. So, therefore, it will is like a combination of the two and will give a better approximation for us. So, let us see that actually what will happen when we convert. Now, we are specifically talking about omega domain. See, in forward dealer approximation, we have s equal to 1 upon t z minus 1. So, I 
So, or z is 1 plus st. So, if you look at z equal to 1 plus st, this is a line effectively, right? 1 plus st. So, this is z plane. So, omega d, d is for discrete. I usually use it to emphasize that we are talking about discrete time. Sometimes it is called digital, but here there is no digital. We are talking about discrete time. Values are analog. So, it says omega d, sigma d. Let's talk about z domain. This is z, right? So, now this is a unit circle. And we know that unit circle is equivalent with s equal to 0, right? e to the power sts and effectively not just zero effectively when magnitude of z is one therefore effectively it is e to the power sts effectively it becomes e to the power j omega t so therefore magnitude becomes one in fact j omega in the real transformation without any approximation will map on a unit circuit right now let's see with forward Euler approximation what will happen. How, wh what will be the curve on which this j omega axis will be mapped? If I replace s by j capital omega, so it becomes 1 plus j omega t. If I show that, that actually is this line, which is shown with dotted uh, style. So instead of having this circle, which is the correct way. Now I have only this one. Means that I have a vertical line which is tangent to unit circle at sigma d equal to 1 and omega d equal to 0. So that means that this is the meaning of approximation. So therefore I cannot deviate from this line too much, right? Because I cannot, I cannot deviate from this circle too much because then the approximation goes wrong. That is again equivalent with the same thing. If I cannot deviate, that means that I have to be in vicinity of 1. That means st has to be very small. Or here is omega t. That means again, Nyquist ray could, should be very high. That is the other way of looking at the distortion due to the uh, non-ideal sampling. So therefore, the only point where I get exact mapping is this point. Because this is on the unit circle. And that is equivalent with sigma d equal to 1. Which is equivalent with s equal to 0. In, that means that if I have a DC signal, that's okay. Because whatever frequency I sample it, I will not have a problem. I will get exactly the baseband available later on. I will not have distortion. But other than that, we have to be close to that. So therefore, I cannot reduce sampling rate too much. Another point is that, which is actually is not good news for forward delay approximation, is that if I look at the transformation from S to Z, we know that discrete time system is a stable as poles are inside unit circle, right? Have you had the DSP and Z transform? Are you familiar with the properties of the transfer functions in Z domain. Is there anybody who doesn't know? Sure? Yes, you are familiar with Z transform? Okay. Good. So now therefore, if I have a transform which transfer S outside Z unit circle, that means that if I have poles which are on the left side of J omega, right? Means that in omega, in a continuous time domain, corresponding frequency, capital omega, they are on the left side of J omega. So fine. Filter is stable. But here, I have to be very careful because here by this transformation, they may actually come outside units. Therefore, this is very important. If you have a stable filter in continuous time domain, and you use back forward delay approximation to convert it to discrete time, you should be very careful. If your filter doesn't show picking in discrete time, suddenly it starts showing picking. Because now poles are moving close to, of course, if it is completely outside, then it is unstable. So we 
assume that we are taking care of that. So therefore, we have to be careful that if there is a pole which is close to J omega specifically, this pole may move actually outside unit circle in Z domain. So therefore, we have to be careful about this. So therefore, in filter design, this is what is um, considered. In fact, uh, most of the filter design tools, because now there are well different, I mean, uh, by easily available online filter design tools, we don't want to get into manual design of the filter and there is no time also in this uh, so, uh, course for that. But at least we need to understand that what we are doing, what we'll do, and therefore we have to be careful. So this is one thing, the same thing I told you, we have to be careful. If we have a pole which is on the left side of J omega, we have to be careful that this pole should not get out of the unit circle when we convert from continuous time to discrete time. Otherwise, the system, the circuit becomes unstable. Or even if it doesn't become unstable, it may start showing peaking in the transfer function in the vicinity of those poles. And eventually, what will happen is that it tries to bring poles closer to unit circle because the, the whole transfer function or the whole con transformation or mapping is on this line. So therefore, it tries to move the poles on the unit circle. And it is not possible to have any loss in the stop band with this kind of approximation. Because there is no zero on the unit circle. See, if there is a zero on the unit circle, so that means that at some frequencies on the J omega, we have zero transfer function, which is equivalent with infinite loss. But here we don't have it. Therefore, that will not happen. Except, of course, only omega d equal to zero, which is here. We cannot otherwise, we cannot have anything else. Because nothing is mapped effectively on the unit circuit, right? Only omega d equal to zero, not omega d. Omega equal to zero is mapped on omega d equal, on z equal to one, which is equivalent with omega d equal to zero. Other than that, we don't have any other point on the unit circuit. So therefore, that will not happen. So this is also important to understand, like, if I go with forward dealer approximation, I cannot have uh, infinite loss in the stop band. Some filters have this property. They show zeros eventually in the transfer function in the stop band. So here we don't have it. Any question? Okay, so this was one example. And then similarly, we will have the similar example for other two. So I don't write again the way it works, but see in Backward Euler approximation, uh, so the relation between Z and S is this. Z is equal to 1 upon 1 minus ST. So therefore, if you write a real and imaginary part of Z, so you effectively, like say for example U and V, you will get this as a in form of a circle. There we had a line, this becomes a circle. So therefore, z as a function of s becomes a circle with a radius of 1 upon 2, which is tangent to unit circle at s equal to, at sigma d or uh, equal to 1, which is equivalent with omega d equal to 0 on the unit circle. And interestingly, exactly opposite to forward Euler, which was a line outside the circle, tangent to the circle, but outside the unit circle. Here, the mapping is the circle which is actually inside the unit circle. That means that this is exactly op opposite to that case. Means that suppose if you have high Q poles, means po high Q poles are poles which are very close to J omega axis in continuous time frequency domain. If you have poles which are very close to J omega axis, these poles actually will appear with lower Q because this tries to reduce the picking. This is exactly opposite to forward dealer. So it is a smooth. In forward dealer, picking appears if I have a smooth transfer function. 
In backward dollar, if I have picking, it tries to smoothen it. So these are exactly operating in an opposite manner. So this circle C is image of J omega axis. What we are doing, we are mapping from S to Z by keeping S equal to J omega. See that what will happen in the mapping of frequency. In fact, Fourier frequency to Z domain. See, ideally should be the unit circle because of approximation becomes this smaller circle. And that's why, specifically in passband edges, when you have the picking, more often you have a picking in the passband edges. During that, that picking gets converted to kind of rounding. So picking reduces and gets smooth. So it will be smooth. But at least here there is no issue of the stability problem that we see with forward dealer. Is that clear? So therefore, if we have a stable filter in a continuous time domain, that will remain stable in discrete time domain if we realize using backward dealer approximation. And very interesting is the bilinear approximation, which is based on the consideration of the integral as value of x, which is average of x of n minus 1 and x of n. And here what will happen is the conversion from omega axis, j omega axis in continuous time frequency domain to discrete time frequency domain will be still a circle and that is the unit. So this means that this is the best approximation and that's why bilinear transformation will give you the best approximation. Of course the relation is not linear means that omega d is not exactly a linear function of omega. It will be only if omega d is very small. And that again means that Nike stress is very high. When we say omega d is very small, that means that omega multiplied by capital T is very small. That means that omega divided by fs is very small. That means that Nike rate is very high. Sampling frequency is much more than the maximum frequency available in the input spectrum. But at least it, it gives you exactly the mapping on the unit circle. So this is the best approximation. I have uh, five minutes time. I want to show you this approximation uh, that I showed you in this slide. Uh, what will be the other way around that way we can write it, which is eventually for forward dealer. It's something very similar to this, which is for the integrator. So eventually integrator is minus C1 by C2. Okay, so we have H of Z. Minus C1 by C2. Z minus 1. And z is e to the power j omega t. The way I showed you in the slide, I actually used the expansion of exponential function. Here, I use a different way and then show this transfer function without showing those terms. I just replace the e to the, I write e to the power j omega t in a way that I can convert it to a function of e to the power j omega t, which is easier to understand. So therefore, here what I do is that I just take the factor from e to the power j omega t by 2. So therefore, I will get minus c1 by c2 multiply by, so I will take integration, so therefore it becomes in the numerator, it becomes minus j omega t by 2. Multiply by 1 upon e to the power j omega t by 2 minus e to the power minus j omega t by 2. Okay. So, therefore, here what I did is just I take the derivative. That I take the factor of e to the power minus j omega t2. Actually, this is a trick you can always apply. Whenever you have z minus 1, it is e to the power j omega t minus 1. Just take a factor. 
What will happen is that you will end off with a term which can give you either cosine or sine. And therefore, it directly gives you the function. This is just a uh, trick you can always apply. It. it works most of the time. So, therefore, now if you look, why I am doing that? Because e to the power minus three omega t by two doesn't create any distortion because magnitude of that is always one. So, I don't have a problem with that. Minus c1 by c2 also is the gain of integrator that I want, so I keep it. I don't have a, any issue with these two. Therefore, these two don't contribute to nonlinearity or distortion. Actually, this is the last term which contributes. And now, what is the relation for the last term? See, it is 1 upon e to the power jx minus e to the power minus jx, which becomes 2j sine, right? So, therefore, I, will, I write it in that way. 1 upon, so this becomes 2j sine omega t by 2. Now, you write, you see exactly a very nice way of looking at distortion. This is the exact relation. I have not used any approximation. You have a transfer function where instead of having a polynomial, you have a sine, right? This sign can become almost equal to omega t by 2 if omega t is very small, which is again same thing. Like a rate is pretty high. So, therefore, this is actual transfer function that you have. And this sign will give you the distortion. And it's periodic. It is expected because the spectrum in discrete time domain should be periodic with the period of uh, 2 pi. So, therefore, omega t, which is actually now omega d, will get converted. So, therefore, I can write in that way. H of z, which is e to the power j omega d, now will be minus c1 by c2 e to the power minus j omega d by 2 multiplied by 1 upon 2j sine omega d by 2. Okay, so this was just uh, for writing the uh, exact transfer function, how it will look like. Now you can actually plot it. And uh, so, therefore, be careful. So, for example, at omega equal to 0, which is expected to have a pole, because it is at z equal to 1. Because integrator eventually at DC frequency will give you the pole, because if you accumulate a signal which is constant over time, so it will increase over time, so it will be infinite, which is also shown over here, sign becomes 0. So, eventually, as frequency increases, you have a sine function. So, it will reduce the, it is nonlinearly reduced the effect of those high frequencies in the sense that now it applies a nonlinear function, which is sine of omega d by 2 on the omega d. And then it will give you the transfer function. It's like that. It's like you have a pre-processing, which is happening implicitly. It converts frequency to sine of frequency, and then it will give you the transfer function. And that sign is the distortion. And depending on how much is the omega d value, which is equivalent with Nike straight, you will have the distortion. Okay. So, this is actually now we see that how SNDR gets affected by the Nike straight. I mean, SDR, if you want to be specific. Right now, we are not talking about noise, distortion, signal to distortion. Okay. So, we'll continue. Uh, I, I see that if I can spend, see, we have spent two extra lectures. So, but I see that if I can spend, I, if not, then I will start uh, data converters from tomorrow. I'll see that. Mm -hmm.